Previously on Unscripted. We didn't get any news about the substance in your pocket. I mean, there's no leads on that front. I have a theory. I think someone put the substance in the pocket. I think somebody sabotaged my jacket. Wow, sabotage. Big accusations being levied here. You're listening to Unscripted with Skip Sherman and Josh Obadia. Okay, Skip, so today we're going to talk about the TV series The Bear, uh, which has two seasons. And it's a show that's available on Disney Plus in Canada, and I believe it's on Hulu in the United States. But before we get to that, I know that you've played the game Tetris before. And watched the movie. (laughs) And watched the movie. I didn't know this, and maybe you did, but there's like a way to play Tetris. You know how when you get to like the higher screens, when you do really well, it gets really, really fast. The pieces start coming down so fast, and there's no way you can do anything. And then eventually the game ends. Well, yeah. But there's a way to sort of break the game where you get the highest possible score that you can get and you basically beat Tetris. But, okay, I have, this This brings up so many questions. Okay. So, like, first of all, why are you thinking about this? Well, I'll tell you. There's a, I have a story here. <laughs> And did you ever play Tetris in the arcade or like, like, no, no, I never played the arcade, but it doesn't matter if it's at the arcade or at home or whatever. There's a way to sort of, I don't know if it's break the game, but you get the highest possible score that you could get, which is 999,999. Like you can't get higher than that. And then what happens is when you get there, it freezes and you've won, you've beat the game. Oh, so the game actually doesn't continue forever. It ends. There's an end. Right. And it didn't end because you screwed up. It ended because you got Mm. the highest score. And Mm. apparently there was an AI bot that was able to get this high score. So an AI could play Tetris? Apparently. Just like an (laughs) AI could play chess, right? I guess. I guess. But like Tetris is not just a game of, of like... It's not just a mental game. There's a dexterity involved. It's a hand-eye coordination aspect. An right. AI doesn't even have a hand or an eye. Well, <laughs> well, about a week or two ago, a 13-year-old kid, he got to 999999. He did it. And it's the first time, apparently it's the first time a human has ever done it. And he even, he even talks about it because I just want to read this. The, the, the teenager... He, he used a technique called rolling. I've never heard of this. It's where he holds the controller in such a manner that he can press the D-pad up to 20 times a second. Previously, other people who played Tetris favored the hyper-tapping method. <laughs> this is like competitive Tetris. There's like terminology. Yes. There's names for the moves. And there is I competitive mean... Tetris. Like last year, I was able to watch the Tetris championships on TSN. I didn't see it this year, so maybe they stopped showing it. I would love to see that. Anyway, so this 13-year-old kid, he got to 999-999, and he's got the highest score ever now. And he's the only human to do it, apparently. So our first episode of the year, you don't wish me Happy New Year, you don't wish the, the listeners Happy New Year, and you launch right into competitive Tetris. Like... Well, I mean, it's the only video game that I ever liked, first of all. We talked about the movie a few episodes ago, so I figured it was fitting. This is not a slight against you. I think this is like, I'm praising you, because this is what we're all about. This is this is everything we're all about. Unscripted is literally what it says. Like, I don't know what the hell you're going to talk about when you open the show. I, 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 If I had the outtakes, p- listeners would laugh at the outtakes, At the beginning of every show, before we hit record, I'm like, do you know how you're going to start the show? And you say, yes, I know I'm going to start the show, and I have no idea what it's going to be about. Today, we got Tetris. So I went on too long about that, and and, and now we've cut into the listener mail portion. So let's go to that. Mailbag. Well, the good thing is we don't have a lot of listener mail because the listeners, you know, during the Christmas break, this is our first episode back from a little vacay, you know, vacation time, downtime. There's not a lot of listener mail. Um, Mark from Philadelphia, um, he loved, he loved the fact that I mentioned Bryson Stott's viral grand slam as my play of the year. Of course, you know, he's a Philly guy too. Mm -hmm. Um, and he sent me this very interesting article that breaks down the entire one minute and 57 second moment into like little, little 
uh, segments. It literally breaks down the whole 1 minute and 57 second clip like in great, great detail about this viral home run. I'll, I'll post the link in the episode description because it's if you're interested in this, this play, it's kind of interesting. And apparently there was a bat flip. He flipped his bat that no one ever saw. <laughs> like no one saw it. it. It wasn't televised, right? So only if you were there and you noticed it, you saw him flip his bat really uh, apparently very dramatically. I'm surprised that with all the cameras, there's, there's at least a dozen cameras, if not 20 cameras at a game. Of course. And no yeah. one saw and no, none, not one of those cameras caught the bat flip. I'm I'm stunned. Well, well, I think in the in more it's more in the clip that's so circulating on social media you don't ever see it because the ball's going into the stands. You know, um, I want to tell you that it's related to listener mail because Mark mentioned that because because I told you we were going to rent the Taylor Swift Eras movie for nineteen dollars and eighty nine cents. You told me that you did rent it. Yeah, I I actually did, and then you had mentioned that that's more expensive than going to see a movie, but Mark actually messaged me saying, you know, it depends how many people are watching for the $19.89, so in our family, we were three people watching, so it's actually cheaper than going to a movie. That's true, yes, I did, I did think about that after I said it. I do want to tell you that I really enjoyed the Taylor, Taylor Swift era's uh, concert movie, it was great, and actually, you should watch it, I'll pay for you to watch it, and we could review it together if you want. Okay, well, let me think about that. <laughs> now, a lot of that's that's it for listener mail. Um, a lot of times in the listener mail segment, we do corrections. I don't have a correction, but I have a coincidence. So this is something new. This reminds me of a Seinfeld episode. What's a coincidence? <laughs> There's no such thing as degrees of coincidence. There's only coincidence, right? I believe that is the line. Uh, this morning... Literally early this morning, because I couldn't sleep and I was up super early, I started watching a new show that you, you don't care what show it is, but it's a show you'll never watch, which is even more interesting. And the show is called Echo. It's on Disney+. Plus. It's a kind of part of the Marvel universe of superheroes, you know. Um, and it's what's interesting about it is they actually released all the episodes at once. You don't have to wait week to week to watch it. It's different than they don't do that anymore. But in this case, for whatever reason, they put them all out and you can watch them all if you want to watch them all one day. But the interesting thing for you and why I'm bringing this up as a coincidence is your number one song, most favorite song of the year, Burning by the Yeah Yeah Yeahs, is the theme song for this show. That's insane. <laughs> I'm watching the show. And in the first episode, they, there was no intro because it jumps that the way they produced it, there was no intro. But there was a huge um, like outro where they were like coming up on this season of Echo, like where they were going to show you like what's kind of what was coming up and all the rest of the eight episodes. And the song starts playing. It's like a montage. And I'm like, this song's really familiar. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, wait a minute. This is Josh's song, Burning, you know? It was it was it was super cool, you know? Like honestly, it was like I was like this is super weird. We're going to record in 2 hours and we just talked about it last episode and here it is on my TV on Josh's favorite song of the year on a show that Josh will never watch or even know existed, you know? So, this is kind of like you mentioned coincidences, which is, you know, a Seinfeld reference that, you know, we know and love, but this is actually worlds colliding also. It is. You know, this reminds me at least 10 years ago, maybe more, I was watching a movie. I think it was on television. I don't even remember the name of the movie or anything that it's about. And then the final ending credits start rolling. And you know, they usually play a song during the ending credits. And all of a sudden, I hear Pigeon Camera. For people who don't know, it's a song by the Tragically Hip. You know, I would love to know what's on, what show that is. I don't know. It was a movie. I don't know what movie it was. It's a long time ago. I don't remember. Okay, so we'll be right back after this to talk about The Bear. You're listening to Unscripted. Are you taking a month-long vacation in the stratosphere and you know how hard it is to hold your breath? Are you the cosmic kid in full costume dress? You've got a nice little place in the podcast universe with Set Lusting Bruce. Set Lusting Bruce is your podcast for all things Bruce Springsteen fandom. We discuss his music, we talk about his tour, and we also talk to fans of other musicians and share their story of their passion, their fandom, and the way that their favorite artist music makes them feel. 
Set Lasting Bruce, a Bruce Springsteen fan podcast, is available wherever you find podcasts. Remember, there is magic in the night. And now, back to Unscripted. Okay, Skip, we're back. All right, we're going to talk about the show, The Bear, which, as you mentioned, is a Hulu-produced show. Uh, In the U.S., it's on Hulu, but, of course, internationally, which is where we are in Canada, is on Disney. Plus, um, I'll just give the premise of the show. I mean, if you're listening, it's kind of weird for me. I was like, I think I should give the premise of the show. But, like, the thing is, if you see the title of this episode, (laughs) you're not going to listen unless you've watched it. Because we're about to do spoil the whole two seasons for you this whole show is spoilers right so the show is about um an award-winning chef uh his name is carmy played by the actor jeremy allen white who returns to his hometown of chicago to manage the chaotic kitchen uh at his deceased brother's sandwich shop it sounds like like who could make a show about this but like people love it right it's about like the restaurant world the inside of a restaurant and it's a stress inducing show. The show is chaotic. Like it describes and like I just described, it's really a chaotic show. Um, timely in that we're doing this today. Uh, the golden globes were just like this week. Um, and that, the bear had five nominations and actually had three wins, including best comedy series, um, best actor and best actress. Like it swept the golden globes, like the main awards. So it's uh, obviously critically acclaimed. Uh, We'll find out if we like it, I guess, right? We're about to tell you. So let me tell you how I heard about this show. I heard about it just over a year ago. And it's because I was watching another show on Disney Plus called Fleischman is in Trouble. And at the end of every episode, there would be a a pop-up would pop up, you know, you might like this also. And it kept popping up to the bear. And I had no clue what it was about. And then I was at a friend's house and they had told me that they watched the show. So I said, okay, I'll start watching it. And I did. And I basically watched both seasons in 2023 or January, 2024. You know, it's interesting. I had a similar experience in that I didn't even know about the show. And then a few friends recommended it. And so we watched season one much, much later than when it aired. I I recommended it to you. I was one of those friends. Yeah. And then... The thing about season one is the episodes are really short. They are, yeah, like 30 minutes or less, I think, maybe. Well, even less. So, like, we watched season one in, like, a snap. It was over. I'm like, okay. And it has a cool ending at the end of the season one, you know? So you're like, okay. And then, truthfully, I didn't love season one. I thought it was, like, okay. It was entertaining. It was different. It's super fast-paced. The dialogue is super snappy. Like I said, it's stress-inducing. It's the inside of a kitchen. It's basically people yelling at each other all every episode. It's, like, it's very, very chaotic. It's not for everybody. It makes my brain hurt. But there's a really cool ending at the end of season one with a little bit of, like, a, not a cliffhanger, but, you know, just, I mean, like I said, there's spoilers. Like, when they find all the money in the tomato cans, you know, you're like, oh, shoot, like, this guy, now they, where did this come from? And then, honestly, I didn't love the show. I probably would have never watched season two. Like, I didn't love, I didn't like it enough to watch season two. But then, other friends started telling me, Season two, you got to watch The Bear. It's so good. It's so good. It's so good. So I watched season two. And I have to admit, there are some great, great moments in season two. There's some, the the characters develop more. You get to know a little of them a bit more. Uh, More stuff happens. Um, It's just, I liked a lot of season two um, more than I liked season one. I think it was a more well-rounded show. You know, like sometimes, you know, they decide we're going to make season one and it's like an experiment. I felt like season one, the the producers were like, we're going to do something super cool. It's going to be different, you know? And then they're like, okay, now do make season two. They're like, oh, okay, now what are we going to do? You know? So like they kind of make it into like a little bit better, you know, like they they more mainstream, although it's still yelling for half an hour every show. And in the case of episode, the Christmas episode, it's yelling for one hour, you know? So. Right, I think that episode is number six called Fishes. It, correct, yes. So I actually, I liked season one better. You did? Yeah, um, I thought it was interesting and, and cool. Um, and, and I guess, I don't know, this is me just being nitpicky, but, you know, at the end of season one, when they say they're going to shut down and reopen, 
Yeah. I thought they're just going to basically reopen the same type of restaurant, just better. But what he did was he he completely scrubbed because it used to be just basically like a kind of like the orange julep. You show up, you order a sandwich, and you leave. It wasn't like a fancy sit down place. And now and now he's converted it into a fancy sit down restaurant. Which which I'm you know again this is more logistics than anything else, but I don't know how they fit that new restaurant into the same space where they had the old one. Cause the old one looked like it was pretty small. They never showed us the full, full space. I thought the same thing. I'm like, how are they going to make a five star Michelin, res- a Michelin star restaurant? Like in this sandwich shop, you know? In right. This, Cause it was this, basically uh, like a counter. It wasn't even like a, you know? Yeah. But they never, I don't think they showed us the full space. But anyways, that's the magic of TV anyways. Like they can kind of do what they want. But like, I had the same question as you. I was like, in my mind, like, even at the beginning when they say they're going to open up this super fancy restaurant, I was like, why didn't they just do, why didn't they just, because he he has to, like, get a loan from his uncle for all this money, right? Because they want to make this brand new fancy restaurant and do all these things. I'm like, you could have got a much smaller loan, renovated the existing shop, and made a really cool sandwich, like, just make the sandwich shop better, you know? And that's what I thought they were going to do. But, you know, otherwise, I guess we wouldn't have a show. And the whole point of it is that uh, Carmi, the lead character, is this really famous chef that worked at all these really famous restaurants with other famous chefs, which is what we find out a little bit in season two. And he wants to do his own thing his way, right? Like, he wants to do it his way now, not like how his so-called mentors, you know, how poorly they treated him and all the stress that was on him and... Um, it kind of shows up a little bit at the end. I'll talk about it in a sec. You know, like when he's locked in the freezer um, in the last episode, I think all the trauma of everything that he went through, like the stress of opening a restaurant and everything. And he says, I mean, that's the reason why him and his girlfriend break up, right? Because he he he's like, if I wasn't dating her, everything would have been fine. He basically says it and she's standing outside the, the door of the freezer. And she hears it, and then she's like, "Screw you!" And she leaves. And then he hears the message that he leaves that she left on his voicemail, saying that she's in love with him, and he feels like an idiot because everything he wanted to change about how to run a restaurant his way, like it all came back against him, you know. And he he doesn't know how to get out of that crazy cycle of like the pressure of the restaurant, you know. Like it's he kind of he is an idiot because like things were actually going well, like everything was going well, the restaurant, his personal life. Yeah. And like, yeah. he had to sabotage it. Why? But the thing is, when he was locked in the freezer, all his team that he cultivated, like he he invested so much time in his team, right? That was the that was like the, the big arc of season two, right? He sends Richie to work as a host in a super fancy restaurant. He sends Marcus, the pastry chef, to Denmark to work at the most famous restaurant in the world. He sends, I forget her name, Tina... The other cook, he sends her to a cooking school, right? He invests time in his people so that they could be better at their jobs. And then when he's locked in the freezer, everybody steps up and everything's cool. Exactly. It's it's... So like I said, everything was going great. He didn't need to sabotage it. No, he sabotaged himself, right? Yes, he did. And it's too bad because his girlfriend, Claire, I mean, she's the best thing that ever happened to him. You know, like... He, he he they tell you that he's been in love with her since high school. He had a crush on her when they were teenagers and she's super smart. She's a doctor, right? Like like she she's everything, you know? And then he's like he just screws it up. So I mean, I guess I mean, we know that there is going to be season 3. Um I guess it's probably going to be more maybe him trying to get back with her. I don't know. I'm not sure. So I wrote down, you know, throughout every episode, there's a bunch of words that they yell out in the kitchen. Okay, sure. By the way, by the way, let me back up here. I could never work at a restaurant. Let me just say that. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no. And I've First seen of all, now, I've seen now this show and also there's a few other shows that I've watched where there are scenes in a in a restaurant kitchen and it seems to all be the same. Like it doesn't matter yeah. what kind of restaurant you're working yeah. in, for some reason everyone calls the chef chef. Chef. Instead of okay. calling him by his name or her by her name. Which I, it's kind of like Seinfeld with the maestro. Right. Or or maybe it's like football with you call him coach instead of by his name. I don't know. 
I, I don't really, I don't really get the whole chef thing. And, and like, you know, when they talk to each other, it's like the chef will say something and then everyone will repeat it back almost like they're in the army. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, whatever. So I wrote down six words that keep repeating throughout every episode and what they actually mean. I mean, you know what the words mean, but I, what they mean when you're working at a restaurant. Okay. Let's hear it. This is good. So the first one is hands. Like you always hear them yelling hands, 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 which, I mean, if you watch a show, it means I need servers to take these plates. Oh, that's cool. Another one is another one you hear all the time. Corner. It means I'm letting everyone know I'm rounding the corner. So don't crash into me. Right. Because right, I don't right. want to drop all this food. Right. Another one is all day. So that's the total orders needed of an item right now. Really? I didn't make this up. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Okay. The next one is family. That means the pre-shift meal made by the staff for the staff. Right. Right. That, that's a recurring thing that happens a few times in the show, right? They have the... I've got two more. Uh, fire. That means start cooking this. But it also means right. this is really good. So that one actually has two meanings. Right, okay. And, this fin- thing is fire or- and finally, this one you probably know, 86, which means we're, we're all out of that item. Don't let anybody order it. 86, that's like an old expression from the 50s. So it's interesting because there's two articles that I looked, that I looked up that I came across while researching for today um, from food sources. Like one is from Bon Appetit magazine and the other one's from Food and Wine magazine. And the article in Bon Appetit magazine is, is amazing because it's from a chef like a, a chef who watched the first episode of the show and then said, I can't watch this because it is anxiety inducing. There's Apparently, there's a lot of reality in the way a kitchen is run in this show that this person being who actually works in a kitchen is like, I can't watch this. This is what I do every day. I don't need to watch this for entertainment. It's making me nuts and I'm going to have a nervous breakdown type of thing. And there's another article. The other one in Food and Wine magazine is... Um, it's all about like what they got right, how realistic is it, and apparently it is quite realistic <laughs> the way the way a kitchen runs. So it, it, I think they did a good job of 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 researching all that type of stuff. Kind of cool though, don't, don't you think? Yeah, no, I, you're right, and I I would hope they would have done that research um, because if it's really not like that, then I don't want to see this. So it is right, it is right. sort of like uh, inside baseball behind the scenes look of what happens in a, in a restaurant because you know when you go to a restaurant. You'd never go to the kitchen, probably. I'm sure no, they wouldn't let no. you there. And so uh, it, it is cool to see what goes on. But no, I, again, I would not want to work at a restaurant. One thing I want to mention, you mentioned that uh, that long episode in the second the season, fishes. fishes. It's longer than all the other episodes. I think it's more than an hour. So yeah, that was also, even though none of it took place in a restaurant, it took place at someone's house, the family's house, at, at, I think at Christmas dinner or something. Um, that was also real. But again, I didn't want to see that because it was basically just family arguing with each other about family things, which probably happens in every family, but I don't need to see that. It's a little bit too real. Like Thanksgiving dinners, Christmas dinners with family, aunts and uncles, cousins that you don't get together with, arguments start, people are just yelling at each other, no one knows what's going on. I mean, the only thing different there is like Jamie Lee Curtis, who plays Carmi's mom, I mean, she was pretty incredible. And then obviously the car gets driven into the house. Like that's like a little bit extreme. I don't think you've ever been in a family dinner where the car got driven into the house. I mean, I hope not. Um, I, I really like Jamie Lee Curtis. She did a great job. And then again, she she comes back in the finale. Um, it was great to see. It was, I, I liked that, what they did with the Carmi's mom, you know, um, kind of the the mental illness aspect of the show. You know, there's something not right with her. Um, and then obviously we know that his brother committed suicide. So there's also like a depression aspect in the show. And I think that's part of Carmi's fear. Like he's worried, like he doesn't want to be that. You know, that's part of why he he has this... Um, like the the way he is where he is like he he it's hard for him to have relationships it's hard for him to have friendships it's hard he, he's just he's messed up you know like <laughs> do you do you like any of the characters more than others like i just mentioned Jamie Lee Curtis character she's like a, a side character she's only in a couple of episodes but like and i did mention that i really like Claire obviously Carmi's the main character and then Sydney the the kind of sous chef who becomes his kind of de facto partner um is really really well done 
and then Richie, <laughs> cousin. I love how they just call each other cousin. Um, Richie, I couldn't stand him. I couldn't stand him in season one. He's such an idiot. What a jerk. He's so mean. He's so, he's just awful. And then the beauty of television is that we get this episode, um, season episode seven, where where Carmi sends Richie to work at this really fancy, to train at this really fancy restaurant in Chicago, literally the fanciest restaurant in the city. And this is like Richie's redemption, you know, his, his, his turnaround, you know, where you start to root for him and he, he kind of sees his calling and he, he kind of ha- like, it's his light bulb moment. It's his, his big epiphany where he's like, shoot, I don't have to be such an ass all the time. Like, he finds something that he likes. He finds something that he likes to do, and he decides he's gonna want to do it really well. And then, of course, you know, he shows up for work the next day at the at their restaurant in a suit, and everyone's like, "Why are you wearing a suit?" And he's like, "This is the new me," you know. Like, I really, really love that episode called Forks, which is Richie's redemption. It's really, really well done. And the other thing that I like about Richie is that he is a secret Swifty. He likes Taylor Swift. <laughs> That's true. Um, you're absolutely yeah. right. Right after that, right after he goes to work at that um, at that fancy restaurant for a week or whatever, uh, he yeah. completely changes. And yes, he was very yeah. annoying prior to that. Um, yeah, he but, was so annoying. I couldn't even watch him. It was it was it was str- he was the most stressful part of the show. My my favorite character is uh, Carmi's sister Natalie because she's great. She's, she's great. The, she's the only one that actually. First of all, she's pregnant. And yet, yeah. and yet she's the only one that like is organized. Like if it's not for her, none of this happens because Carmi, he knows how to cook a meal and Richie, he knows how to dry forks and he knows how to greet staff now ever since he, uh, he did that stage at that training. restaurant. But like, yeah. And Sydney it, could design the menu and the others could cook the food, but like but she's the keeping whole, it the all whole, together. The whole renovation of the restaurant, dealing with yeah. all the bureaucrats and dealing with all the red tape that you have to go through. If, if she's not there, none of that even happens. So, absolutely. so she's my, she's actually my favorite character. So speaking of the red tape, uh, another really good character who's really the funniest one in the show is their friend, Fack. <laughs> he's hilarious, actually. Neil. His first name's Neil, by the way. Neil, yeah. He's like the handyman. He kind of does whatever they need him to do. And there's the the really good episode, um, the I think it's episode eight, where they do the fire, where they have to do pass the fire suppression test mm-hmm. from the city. Mm-hmm. And they've never passed it. They keep failing. And then literally at the last minute, they figure out that Carmine's brother had rigged the fire suppression test and and turned off all their... That's why they kept failing, right? Because they wanted the oven to fire as hot as possible, and he was basically flaunting all the safety measures. So once FAC figured that out and turned it back on, they finally passed the test. The other thing about Neil, or FAC, same guy, so yes, he's like their handyman that fixes things. But there was one time where, you know, they yelled family, which is the the pre-shift meal made by the staff for the staff, yeah. and he wanted to yeah. be involved. And someone says to him, you're not part of the staff. <laughs> I, it was so mean to him. I, I felt so bad for him. He's there all the time. The guy's nothing else to do. They let him work and he does everything they ask, you know? I mean, he doesn't even know how to be a handyman. It's, it's so weird because they're like, you need to fix all the electricity in the place. And he's like, sure. He doesn't know what to do. He just, I don't know. He just figures it out by trial and error, I guess. I think it's by trial and error. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So I mentioned um, season one, episode eight, when they find the money in the cans of tomatoes. That's like the best part of season one for me. Uh, The episode Forks, Richie's Redemption is great. And then the fire suppression test. And then eventually like season two, episode 10, the finale is when the restaurant finally opens for friends and family. It's kind of like the soft open and you see them in action. And like I said, they all step up when Carmi's locked in the freezer. And it's a, it's a great ending to the season. I really like the ending of the whole thing. You know, like it was good. It was really well done. I, I did like the ending and I liked some of those episodes you mentioned. I liked the episode Forks and I liked the last episode of both season one and season two. An episode that yeah. I didn't really love was when Marcus goes to Denmark 
Um, yeah. I mean, I realize, you know, they want to show how he's going to like the best restaurant in the world, supposedly, and he's learning yeah. how to make desserts. Um, and I don't know. Like, is that really how desserts are made? I, I don't know. It I seems know. like they take so long to make one dessert. It seems ridiculous. But, you know, the restaurant that he goes to in Denmark, they don't name it. But like I've watched, you know me, I watch a lot of food shows and stuff. You know, um, the 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 the, be- the one of the top restaurants in the world is in Copenhagen, and it's called Noma, and that is so- the restaurant that they're trying to show. Like I, I know I, you can tell if you've seen Noma in other shows, this is what they're trying to show that that this is the restaurant where he went. Um, yeah, it is a bit crazy. Like you make this tiny dessert, and it's like literally made to order. But I mean, I guess in like a five star restaurant, that's maybe how it is, you know. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> you know me; I'm happy with like a bowl of ice cream for dessert. I don't need a fancy dessert. Is there any characters that you didn't like? I mean, I said I didn't like Richie at the beginning, but then you kind of learned to like him. Um, is there anyone that you really didn't like, or like for me, it's their uncle Jimmy Cicero, or whatever, you right. know, like the one who lends them the money, like. Well, Uncle Jimmy, Uncle Jimmy owns the place basically, right? Like I don't know if he owns the, yeah. the building or the land and and he would just want to he would rather just shut it down and sell it. That's what he wants to do. Well, he to wanted do. to just he he didn't want them to make the restaurant. They had to convince him, right? Yeah. And he gives them like this really unreasonable deadline to open by a certain time, to make this much money by a certain by a certain date. Like it's really seems like highly stressful considering he's like should be on their side, right? But he really actually wants them to fail because <laughs> he right, just wants he... to close it up and sell the place. Exactly. Exactly. And, and he's um he's also in that episode, the one where they do the flashback, um, where yeah. uh, you know before they even have a restaurant, uh, Richie goes to talk to Uncle Jimmy and saying how he wants he wants to work for him, and and, right. and Uncle Jimmy's like, well, why would I hire you? Right, and, yeah. and and Richie's trying to convince him, and then I think Richie mentioned something about selling baseball cards, and and then yeah. and then Uncle Jimmy well, that, says, "Well, I hope you have the Mickey Morandini rookie card or something like that." Yeah, you mentioned that to me. You know, speaking of sports, there's a few tie-ins. You mentioned it on our some of our past episodes. Like uh, Richie carries around Coach K's book. Is it is it Richie or is it Sydney that carries it around? I think it's Sydney that carries it around. I think you're right. You're right. It's Sydney. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, you know, when I looked up, is there going to be season three? I, I, I looked it up this morning, and I'm like, yes, there is. It's confirmed that there's going to be a season three. Yes, but in the speculation, and I think it's more of a joke, is like, could we, could we see Coach K as a cameo in season three? Like, will he be in the show? Like, imagine he's in the show. That would be nuts, no? Well, the show it's set in Chicago. Um, yeah. but I'm not sure. Is it, is it basically just shot on a set in Hollywood? I don't even know where it's no, actually shot. No, I think it's, I, I think it is in Chicago. I think they do it in Chicago. Okay. Okay. One of the cool things about the, uh, the show is that it has a good soundtrack. <laughs> you know what? I, I don't remember. I don't remember any of the music now. Cause it's been such a long time since I watched it. I'm going to tell you some of the best songs that were in the show. Let down by Radiohead animal by Pearl jam. Have You Seen Me Lately by Counting Crows, In Too Deep by Genesis, uh, Strange Currencies by R.E.M., and of course, Love Story by Taylor Swift. <laughs> so when when that song started playing at the end of that episode, I didn't even yeah. realize it was a Taylor Swift song right away, because uh, I don't know her music. I'm, of course, but I mean, but to I, me, I, it's I, very recognizable. I figured it out, obviously. And then there's a great scene where Richie's singing in the car, like it's just like, oh. All the, the Taylor Swift stuff just was an added bonus, you know, honestly, really loved it. All right. So we're, we, we've, I think we've said all we had to say about the show and I'm going to, I think what we decided to do when we're going to talk about uh, shows or movies, we're going to give like a, a star system for now. We're going to call them stars. We may come up with uh, another, uh, another terminology other than stars, but right now it's stars. And uh, we're going to rate it out of five because, you know, normally we do top five. So we'll just do out of five. So uh, I'll go first if you don't mind. So season one, like I said, I didn't love it. I think I'd give it like a three and a half out of five, maybe. Okay. I would give season one four out of five. Four. And then for me, season two, I'd give it four. And I guess for you, it's maybe four or less. 
Uh, season two, I'm going to give it three and a half out of five. Yeah, so overall we have the same impression. It's just you like season one a little bit better than I like season two a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, overall, regardless of like like it, not like it, I think it's worth watching. Like, it's definitely worth watching. I wouldn't tell someone not to watch this show. Okay, we'll be right back after this with some final thoughts. You're listening to Unscripted. Do you know John Hyatt's songs? Maybe you know them from being covered by Roseanne Cash, Three Dog Night, The Neville Brothers, Amy Lou Harris, Eric Clapton, B.B. King, Jeff Healy, Bonnie Raitt, or literally hundreds of others. Maybe you have some of his albums on your shelf or in your cow-horned Cadillac right now. I'm Jesse Jackson. And I'm Sylvan Brough. And we're going to dive in from A to Z. Join us on the Perfectly Good Podcast. We're going to discuss all of your favorites and uncover some forgotten gems. From Aces Up Your Sleeve to Zero House. Rate and debate every John Hyatt song on the Perfectly Good Podcast. Have Have a little little faith. faith. Unscripted with Skip and Josh is available wherever you listen to podcasts. If you listen to the show through Apple Podcasts, please leave a review. To interact with the show, send an email to skipandjoshshow at gmail.com. Follow the show on Twitter and go to Facebook to like the show page. And now, some final thoughts from the guys. So it was a big week for uh, football coaches. Um, three really high-profile high coaches, like, stepped down, you know. Pete Carroll of the Seahawks, who I can't stand. I'm happy to see him go. Uh, Nick Saban of Alabama, who you can't stand. I'm happy to see him go. <laughs> and then, of course, Bill Belichick, which I know you don't like him, but like... I'm happy to see him go. Oh, he is a legend. Now, the, the interesting thing is that the Patriots already announced the replacement. <laughs> and so <laughs> like, did Alabama. Who's replacing Saban? The guy from Washington who just went to the national championship. Oh, I didn't even know that. So... Um, Belichick's being replaced by Jared Mayo. Now, I'm only saying this because I find it interesting because if you look at the leadership of the New England Patriots right now, the owner, Robert Kraft, it's Kraft Mayo. That's all I have to say about that. That's hilarious. I didn't even realize that. You know, when they (laughs) announced his name, I had no clue who he was. I know he used to play and whatever. And I, I know he's been an assistant for like five years, but I had no clue who he was. He's like a Patriot lifer. They drafted him. He played for them. He just coached for them. And now he's going to be the head coach. So. Apparently, there was something in his contract that he signed five years ago that said, like, I don't know if it's explicitly said that he'd be the next head coach if Belichick ever mm. left. But there's something in there okay. that says that, you know, there was a succession plan. You know, I'm happy that Belichick um, was let go or stepped down, whatever it is, it, whether he quit or they let him go, it doesn't matter. I'm happy that it happened because it's consistent with how the Patriots and Belichick himself ran the team. Because once you were no good, once you were on the downside of your career, regardless of what you did for the team in in previous you know seasons, they cut you. He he was like, no, you're not good anymore. I don't care. I don't care if you won three Super Bowls with us. I don't care if you had a two thousand yard seasons. I don't care what you did. You're gone. You know, like they did what made the most sense. At that moment, which is why they were a successful franchise. And now they've done the same thing because they've had a losing season. Last year, they weren't that good. This year, they're horrible. He's gone. You know? (laughs) I'm going to mention the obvious here, but you know that uh, Belichick, all his Super Bowls were with Tom Brady, who could be the best quarterback of all time, even though I don't like him. Yes. Similarly, similarly, everyone praises uh, Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson, I don't know how many championships he's won, 9, 10, 11, but he coached Michael Jordan. He coached Kobe Bryant. I believe he coached Shaq Shaq as well. So, I mean, you know, yeah, Phil Jackson might have been a very good coach, but he also had really good players on his roster. So let's not get carried away. This could be a whole episode. It's like the chicken and the egg, right? Because, you know, Michael Jordan was in the league before Phil Jackson was his coach, and they didn't win the championship. So is it because of a coach? Is it because the player matured? You know, like, there's, there's all kinds of things. And, of course, you know, 
Belichick Brady kind of proved that he didn't need Belichick because he went to the page he went to the uh the Bucks and they won the Super Bowl you know with him so it didn't matter you know um anyways look I'm happy that well look Belichick's gonna wind up somewhere he's not gonna be not a coach someone's gonna hire him don't you think I think someone will but you know unless he's bringing Tom Brady with him I don't know how good he's gonna be he's chasing um He's chasing Don Shula's record. I think he needs like 10 or 11 I think wins. he needs he needs 14 wins to catch him. Oh, there you go. So that's at least two seasons. Like there's not getting a he's not getting a 14 win season next year no, no matter he's where not. he goes, you know. So, I mean, yeah, he'll break the record and he should because he is the best greatest coach of all time. Actually, and, and I he... hope he doesn't. <laughs> I hope he doesn't. Of course you do. Of course. So, you. speaking of football, I have a factoid for you. Sure. I have, I have two factoids for you. One is football. So, you know that the starting quarterback for the Buffalo Bills is Josh Allen. But what I didn't know until about 10 days ago is that the backup quarterback on Buffalo is Kyle Allen. Now, they're not related. <laughs> they're not related. Yeah. But they were picked yeah. in the draft in the same year, and they were born two months apart. But you do know that there's um, there's another Josh Allen, right, in the NFL? <laughs> there is another Josh Allen, and there's also a Keenan Allen in the NFL. Right. <laughs> Just to confuse things. And right? none of them are related. No, none of them are related. What's your other factoid? So in the history of the NHL, there's four goalies who have played a thousand or more games. Without looking it up, can you guess who they are? Martin Brodeur. That's one. Patrick Roy. Oh, Marc-Andre Fleury. That's three. You're just missing one. And what's the era of the last one? Modern era? Old timers? No, no. Similar... To like Patrick Waugh, Martin Brodeur, similar to that. Oh, it's Henrik Lundqvist. No. No? Shoot. Okay, who is it? It's Roberto Luongo. Oh, I should have got I would have got that. If I thought about it for two more seconds, it would have come to me. What's interesting about it, those four are, are, are all born in the province of Quebec. That is a sick stat right there. Love that. You know, the Quebec uh, nationalists are all over that right all right, Josh, that's the first episode of 2024. Yes, it was fun to do. And next episode, we will review a different show. Great chatting with you, and I'll speak to you next time. Have a good week. <laughs>